Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. I just wanted to give you guys some of the latest financial news and do kind of like a, a warning, as I have been warning for a long time, for people to prepare for what is coming, which I think everyone can see is a global financial crisis. So let's go ahead and bring up the latest headlines in this. Uh, this is the first thing that I thought was pretty important. Home prices are collapsing at the fastest pace since 2008. Housing inventories are rising at the fastest pace in history and are already at a level previously associated with deep recession and economic deleveraging. So that is important. There are um, a lot of people saying that this next crash is going to rival 1929, that it's going to be worse than 2008. If you thought 2008 was bad, prepare for things to get a lot worse. So here we have Zero Hedge. Something snaps in the job market. Multiple job holders hit all-time high as unexplained 1.8 million jobs gap emerges. Something very odd emerges for the second month in a row, looking at the July payroll reports. Recall that last month we showed that a stark divergence had opened between the household and establishment surveys that make up the monthly jobs report. And since March, the former was sliding while the latter was rising every single month. In addition to that, full-time jobs were plunging while multiple job holders soared near all-time highs. Guess what? At a time when the Biden administration is now being accused of fabricating energy numbers to push oil prices lower, the jarring divergences and inconsistencies in the job report just hit escape velocity. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's something that I have been saying for a while. Consider the following. On the one hand, the closely followed establishment survey came in red hot, and not only did it soar, despite the U.S. entering a technical recession last week, it printed at a five-month high of 528000 a six sigum beat to consensus expectations of 250k and with wages also coming in hotter than expected rising 0.5 percent month over month or 5.2 percent year over year it was enough for many to conclude that calls of recession are premature because after all you can't enter a recession when jobs are rising by over 500k yeah but that's not accurate but a problem emerges for the second month in a row when looking at third-party data, which tracks the numbers of new employees laid off as well as new layoffs, both of which have soared since May, yet which have unexpectedly not been reflected in the BLS data. Well, obviously that isn't surprising if you understand what they're trying to do. But even if one ignores outside data sources, a more pressing question emerges when looking at the BS BLS's own far more detailed, if less closely watched, household survey. Here, unlike the establishment survey, the June jobs change was a far smaller 179K increase following last month's 315K drop. So you can see it in the chart right there. Since the household survey also feeds other closely watched ratios, such as the labor force participation rate, it explains why, despite the apparent surge, quote unquote, in June jobs, the LFP declined for the second month in a row and is now back to levels last seen in 2021. So what's going on? Well, those who read our article from last month will know what's coming next. Those who haven't will be surprised to learn that something appears to have snapped a few months ago around March when the establishment survey kept on rising unperturbed while the household survey hit some unexpe an unexplained brick wall and hasn't moved at all. Yes, very interesting. In fact, since March, the establishment, establishment survey shows a gain of 1.680 million jobs while the household survey shows an employment loss of 168K. Oof. So what's going on? There's more. Digging in even deeper, we find this drop in household survey employment is the result of both full-time and part-time jobs. In fact, as shown below, since March, the U.S. has lost 141K full-time employees 
and 78K part-time employees. The trend has been persisting into June, when according to BLS, the U.S. labor force saw a 71K drop in full-time workers, offset by a 384K gain in far lower-paying part-time jobs. The offset, multiple job holders or people who have more than one job. People are now being forced to work two jobs, three jobs, or they're losing a full-time job and then are taking a part-time job or numerous part-time jobs. As seen below, while the number of total employees has stagnated, the number of multiple job holders has been growing steadily, hitting a new post-COVID high in June of 7,541 million. So what that means is more and more people are being forced to take on more than one job because they're just not earning enough at their full-time job. The increase for June 92K, which stands in stark contrast to the sharp drop in full-time job holders, but even more notable is that since June, the U.S. has lost 141,000 full-time jobs, 78,000 part-time jobs, while adding a whopping 263K multiple job holders. Even more remarkable, the number of multiple job holders whose primary and secondary jobs are both full-time just hit a record high, hardly the sign of a strong job market where people can afford to quit jobs at will. So this is actually people working two full-time jobs, a primary and secondary full-time job. So that's uh, an eight, a 16-hour day, eight hours, twice. It's a 16-hour day. For people, that's crazy. Fewer people are working, but more people working more than one job. A, rota a rotation which picked up in earnest sometime in March and that has only been captured by the household survey. Since the establishment survey is far slower to pick up on the nuances in employment composition, while the household survey has gone nowhere since March, the BLS data engineers have been busy goal-seeking the establishment survey, perhaps with the occasional nudge from the White House, especially now that the economy is in a technical recession to make it appear as if the economy is growing steadily when in reality all they're doing is applying the same erroneous seasonal adjustment factor that gave such a wrong perspective of the labor market in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. Exactly. So they're fudging the numbers, uh, unsurprisingly. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. We have, we have, to get to rampant inflation and a housing collapse at the same time. Yes, now, now we get to have that. That's really fun. Under normal circumstances, this would never happen. Normally, you would never have raging inflation and a housing crash at the same time. But thanks to the Federal Reserve, that is precisely what uh, we are now facing. The Fed has created a colossal inflation monster, which is going to be exceedingly difficult to tame. Meanwhile, the most epic housing bubble in the history of our country is starting to burst. Exactly. This combination is going to cause immense pain for U.S. consumers, which, by the way, already maxed out in the months ahead, and there is no short-term hope on the horizon. That is why I'm saying in the title of this video is that you must be prepared now. You should have been prepared years ago. Everyone should have seen this coming. I made predictions in December of 2020 where I predicted this exact thing was going to happen. And I told people to start preparing and I gave suggestions of what to do. If you listen to my advice in December of 2020, you will be prepared. You will have several months of food stocked up. You'll have water stocked up. You'll have some um, some leeway here that other people aren't going to have. If you've been to the grocery store lately, you will have probably noticed that prices are very different than where they were just a few short months ago. And that's really more than looking at charts or anything like that. You can see this every day in your life when you go to the grocery store. You can witness it firsthand and how it affects you and how how much your purchasing power has decreased. Everyone can see that when you go to the store and you're paying double, sometimes more than double what you used to pay for chicken breasts. Like that's something that affects everyone, okay? 
Unfortunately, some of our largest corporations are telling us that they're going to continue to pass cost increases along to consumers. Well, yeah, of course that's what they're going to do. Consumers looking for relief from higher prices might have to wait a while. The makers of Coca-Cola beverages, Dove Shampoo, Huggies Diapers, and Big Macs have been raising prices as their costs increase on everything from wood pulp to wages. The executives behind these global brands on Tuesday said they would keep passing along those costs to the shopper for now. Consumers are continuing to buy even as inflation takes a toll on households, these executives said. Yeah, they're going into debt to do that. A lot of them are doing it on credit. In a desperate attempt to get the inflation spiral that they created under control, officials at the Federal Reserve keep raising interest rates. In fact, on Wednesday, we witnessed another historic interest rate increase. Yes, and it was exactly what we expected, 0.75 percentage point increase rate to try to tamp down inflation. Fed officials seem to think they can tame inflation just like Paul Volcker and his minions did in the early 1980s. Well, he did what had to be done, let's be honest. But the truth is that the environment is completely different this time around, and that is unfortunately the case. In the early 80s, the money supply was relatively stable. Today, we are coming off two years in which our leaders behave very foolishly. Oh, this was all by design, guys. It was a massive transfer of wealth. Let's be honest about that. Our politicians borrowed and spent trillions of dollars that we didn't have, and the Federal Reserve pumped trillions of fresh dollars that they created out of thin air into the financial system. And look, they're trying to do it again with their latest scam that they're calling the uh, Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. That is not going to reduce inflation. It's the exact opposite. It is another massive government spending bill. No matter how high the Fed pushes interest rates, it isn't going to make all of that new money magically disappear. Instead, uh, in addition, we are dealing with some very serious long-term supply issues that would have been unimaginable in the 80s. I expect those supply issues will only intensify over time. This will be especially true if more military conflicts erupt around the globe. If officials at the Fed think they can solve the inflation crisis by just crushing demand, they're being delusional, and I agree. Rising interest rates will certainly do one thing. It will absolutely eviscerate the housing market, and that is already starting to happen. On Wednesday, we learned pending home sales in the U.S. were 20% lower this June than they were last June. Yes, exactly. Those numbers are horrible, and they're much worse than expected. And everyone agrees this is happening because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. At this point, things are particularly bad in Zoom towns, such as Boise, Idaho. Yeah, exactly. During pandemic fueled housing boom, Boise emerged as America's hottest, one of America's hottest Zoom towns, communities that experienced a spike in population from an influx of people who are working remotely. Now, the housing boom around Idaho's capital city is ground to a halt. Buyers are balking at record prices and mortgage rates that last month hit a 13 year high. If you're trying to sell a house right now, I feel bad for you as mortgage rates go even higher and even more potential buyers will be pushed out of the marketplace exactly. Meanwhile, we're starting to see an alarming surge in foreclosures as the overall economy slows down. Look at these alarming figures. Looking specifically at foreclosure starts, this metric was up 26.6% in June on a monthly basis, but up 440.91% year over year. That is insane. Starts also represented the highest share, 4% of serious delinquencies since March 2020, but less than half the rate in the years leading up to the pandemic. 440% on a year over year basis. We haven't seen anything like this since 2008, and we all remember what happened in 2008. You remember the massive foreclosures, people facing homelessness on a scale that had really it hadn't been seen before since perhaps maybe 1928. And a new housing crash is here. The Federal Reserve is making things even worse by dramatically hiking interest rates. What in the world are they thinking? You don't raise interest rates when a recession has already begun. That is completely and utterly insane, but it is exactly what they're doing. I'm concerned economic conditions in America could soon very closely resemble my first novel. Economic activity is slowing down everywhere that you look. Layoffs are on the rise. The housing market is collapsing. But meanwhile, prices for essentials, such as 
food and energy continue to rise. The people that are going to be hurt most by all of this are those at the bottom of the economic food chain. A very dark chapter in American history has begun and the months ahead are going to be filled with pain. Exactly. And for people asking, well, why are they doing this? This is crazy. Why do you think they're doing it? It is another massive transfer of wealth. It is designed on purpose. It is on purpose to, um, to destroy the middle class. And this is all going to lead up to their great reset. They first have to create the problem, and then they're going to come in and offer the solution. Why is Walmart laying off so many workers? This is from just a couple days ago. If brighter days are eventually coming for the U.S. economy, why would Walmart be so eager to lay off corporate employees? Of course, the truth is that brighter days are not coming. Yesterday, I posted an article in which I listed 11 companies laying off workers. After I completed that article, I discovered Walmart is also letting people go. If a seemingly unmistakable, unshakable giant such as Walmart already feels compelled to eliminate jobs, what is the outlook for employees of companies that are far, far smaller and far weaker? When Walmart announced it would be laying off nearly 200 corporate employees, it rapidly made headlines all over the nation. Yes, exactly. They are, quote unquote, updating their structure because they know really hard times are coming. That is what the entire purpose of this video is, as I'm trying to uh, let you guys understand that things are going to get really bad and it's not going to be temporary. It's not going to be transitory as others are telling you and, and what the Biden administration is telling you. That is a lie. It is not going to be transitory. It is going to last years and it's going to get much worse before it gets better, if it gets better at all, because they're doing it on purpose and that should be obvious at this point. The projections that the company recently released confirm this. Walmart said it now anticipates adjusted earnings per share for the second quarter and full year to decline around 8 to 9% and 11 to 13% respectively. Previously, the retailer had predicted a 1% fall and had previously forecast for the full year. So you can see how uh, wrong their initial predictions were. And how off they were. I also just learned SoundCloud has decided to lay off approximately 20% of its global workforce, citing a, quote, significant company transformation in the current economic and financial landscape. So they all see what's coming. They know and they're preparing. Uh, they're getting rid of redundancies. They're getting rid of uh, employees that they don't really need. And they're looking to change their business model to prepare for what is coming to try to change and turn things around. Just like in 2008, the pace of layoffs is beginning to accelerate at a pace that is absolutely breathtaking. If you missed my article from yesterday it, that contained many more examples, you can find it linked there. As more Americans lose their jobs, the number of people filing new claims for unemployment benefits will continue to go up. In fact, the number for last week was up to 260,000. The number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits edged higher last week, hovering near the highest level of the year, the latest sign that the historically tight labor market is starting to cool off. And this is every single week, guys. Meanwhile, inflation continues to spiral out of control, and that is causing immense hardship for millions of American families. According to Zero Hedge, the misery index in the United States just hit the highest level since 2011. So many people are hurting out there right now. Many Americans are working as hard as they can, but it still isn't enough to pay the bills because inflation has been absolutely eviscerating standards of living. As a result, more people are falling out of the middle class and into poverty with each passing day. Exactly. Most Americans do not have any savings. Most Americans are one paycheck uh, away from homelessness or losing everything. Uh, many are living paycheck to paycheck. And if there's some kind of emergency, if there's a job loss, a medical emergency, they face losing everything. And that is terrifying. The lines at food banks are getting longer and longer. And many of those that are now showing up for assistance were once solidly part of the middle class. Oh, yeah, we covered that in a prior video. 
Um, you have people that are showing up at food banks for the first time ever. People walking because they couldn't afford the gas to drive there, which is just crazy. The first time Kelly Wilcox drove her 2017 Dodge Grand Caravan to the food pantry near her home in Payson, Utah, she immediately noticed one thing that surprised her. New models of Toyota and Honda sedans and minivans. I saw a bunch of other people with cars like me who had kids in their cars. The mother of four young sons didn't know what to expect when she made an early visit to Tabitha Way's local food pantry this spring. She knew she needed help. Her husband had lost his job. He soon found new job as an account manager, but that wasn't enough with inflation. Can you identify with Kelly Wilcox? When I was growing up, I lived in a middle-class neighborhood and I went to a very large school that was packed with middle-class kids. At that time, I can't remember encountering a single family that was truly impoverished, but these days, it seems like almost everyone is struggling. For years, I have been writing about the disappearance of the middle class, and now we've gotten to a point where the gap between the ultra-wealthy and the rest of us is greater than ever. One recent survey found that nearly half of the country has cut back spending on food because the cost of living has become so oppressive. That is frightening, but the pain we're currently experiencing is just the tip of the iceberg. As I've been warning for a long time, much worse is ahead. Yes, exactly. It's going to get much, much worse. Uh, this um, is that article that he mentioned here. It's happening. A list of 11 big companies that have announced layoffs within the last two weeks. When the economy slows down, layoffs inevitably happen. We witnessed this on a large scale in 2008 and 2009, and it is happening again. So what does that tell you, folks? That tells you that the people running these companies, these multinational corporations, they can see which way the wind is blowing. They are already preparing for another 2008 type situation. And so they're starting to lay people off. They're going to start tightening where they can to prepare themselves. So you need to be prepared also. U.S. economic numbers are rapidly getting worse and companies all across America don't want you to get caught with bloated payrolls as we plunge into a recession. As you'll see below, many of the firms that are laying off workers are either in the real estate industry or tech industry. And we were told, yeah, that those two uh, industries were the things to get into, right? Oh yeah, they're the leading edge of the boom times. And it appears they will also be on the bleeding edge as the economy crashes. And I said years ago, that big tech was massively overvaluated. You really think Apple is worth $2 trillion? Get real. It was always a tragedy. It is always a tragedy whenever any hardworking American is forced out of a job. Unfortunately, what we're witnessing right now is just the beginning. Exactly. There's going to be much more than this. Um, Ultra Tech says it will be laying off more than 600 workers. Electric truck maker uh, Rivian will be laying off 840 workers. 7-Eleven said they're going to be eliminating 880 corporate jobs. Shopify is laying off 1,000 people. Vimeo says it will be eliminating 6% of its entire workforce. Redfin will reduce the size of its workforce by 8%. Compass will reduce its workforce by 10%. Remax by 17%, Robinhood by 23%. That is crazy. Ford preparing to cut as many as 8,000 jobs in the coming weeks. Geico has closed every single one of their offices in the state of California that will result in a vast number of workers losing their jobs. And this is just the beginning. Amazon has announced that it reduced the size of its workforce by approximately 100,000 workers in just one quarter. Amazing. Amazon, by the way, uh, was able to rake in profits during the um, during the COVID pandemic when many small businesses were destroyed, but Amazon was allowed to operate. You could fill up two very large stadiums with 100,000 workers. Eventually, this wave of job losses will become a tsunami. Millions of Americans will suddenly find that they are unable to continue paying their bills. 
Meanwhile, our new housing crash is starting to pick up speed as well. In fact, we just witnessed an absolutely massive spike in the number of Americans that are searching for the term sell my home fast on Google. That's not a good sign. Just like in 2008 and 9, a lot of Americans that bought near the peak of the market paid way more than that house is worth are going to end up underwater on their homes. We didn't learn from history. So now we are repeating it and things are going to get worse and worse for the housing market as the Fed continues to raise interest rates. Of course, it isn't just the U.S. that's going to be suffering in the months ahead. It is going to be global. That is what I have continued to say. And we're going to continue to track and talk about it. The whole planet appears to be heading for a major downturn. And one of the largest shipping companies in the entire world has just confirmed that global economic activity is starting to cool. AP Mahler uh, Marisk on Wednesday predicted a slowdown in global shipping container demand this year amid weakening consumer confidence and supply chain congestion. The Danish shipping and logistics company, one of the world's largest and a broad barometer for global trade, said it loaded 7.4% fewer containers onto ships in the second quarter when compared to the same period in 2021, prompting it to revise the full year outlook for its container business. Europe is being hit harder than just about anywhere else. Many of the numbers that are coming out of Europe are surprisingly bad. And now, thanks to the war in Ukraine, they are bracing for an extremely cold and bitter winter. Yes, exactly. We haven't seen anything like this in Europe since World War II. In Spain, they have already resorted to extreme measures as, a, as they desperately attempt to conserve energy. And it's going to continue to get crazier. I am stunned by many of the things I see in the news every day, and things are only going to get worse as time rolls along. Decades of incredibly foolish decisions have brought us to this point, and instead of reversing course, our leaders continue to take us down the exact same road because it's by design. The goal is to break the global financial system and then come in with a reset, with this solution to the problem that they manufactured. And it will be the UN smart cities. It will be uh, robotics. It will be the fourth industrial revolution. It will be you will own nothing and be happy. It will be the great reset. Uh, and it's not going to be good. So we shall reap what we have sown. And it appears that there is an enormous amount of pain on the horizon. And, and that's the goal. They want there to be pain so that they're going to prolong that pain as long as possible. So that when they come out with their great reset solution... You will be you'll be ready to take anything at that point. Things will be so bad. You will accept this the central bank digital currency. You will accept the smart cities. A matter of life and death. Tens of millions of Americans will be without medicine once trade with China stops. Now, this one is really, really important because I don't think people understand what's going on between the US and China right now and with Russia. And what we're seeing, it's not just uh it's not just trade wars and things like that. What I think is happening is stress testing and preparing for war with China. Um, and I think that if you look at historical cycles, we are around the time where another potential world war would happen. We already have Russia and Ukraine. We have tensions with Taiwan now. And of course, I think that's just going to continue to get worse. And part of this is, and this is what we should learn from this, that globalization has not been a good thing. Thank you, Henry Kissinger. If you are against a war with China, you need to make your voice heard while you still can. Because once the bullets start flying, it'll be too late. Once a war with China starts, our current standard of living won't just be interrupted. The truth is that our current standard of living would end. That's what happens when you subsidize it by outsourcing manufacturing to countries that have slave labor. When you're living off of that slave labor for decades, when companies are profiting at the expense of foreign slave labor... Yeah, what do you think is going to happen? Eventually, you're you're going to have that that changed the standard of living for those companies and for other people, right? In in America, the people that were making the money off of that, yeah, they got really cheap labor that let them have lavish lifestyles, but you're going to have to come back to reality at a certain point. 
the current standard of living would end. There are thousands upon thousands of products that we currently get from China that would very quickly disappear from our store shelves. Yeah, because they don't manufacture things in America anymore. They outsourced all of it so that they could make more money, not caring how that affected the American worker who lost their jobs. No manufacturing jobs here. You gave it away to other people. They simply would not be available any longer. And Taiwan produces more of our microchips than anyone else in the world by a very wide margin. Why don't we produce our own? Why do we rely on all these other countries? Well, this is globalization. When the microchips stop flowing, our whole economy will come to a crashing halt. So the stakes are incredibly high and most people don't realize it. Nancy Pelosi knew that her visit to Taiwan would absolutely enrage the Chinese, but she did it anyway. Yes, she did. Pelosi and the rest of her delegation disembarked from a U.S. Air Force transport plane at Songshan Airport, downtown Taipei, after the nighttime landing on a flight from Malaysia. That began a visit that risks pushing the U.S.-Chinese relations to a new low. Yes, she knew that. China is warning that there will be a military response and the whole world is waiting to see what that will be. We've seen U.S. Uh, spy planes around Taiwan. We've seen the Chinese uh, making some movements there. I wouldn't call it technically a military response, but what I will say is that they're probably going to take Taiwan uh, within the next year, if the Chinese don't do anything more than they have already done, it will look like a big victory for Nancy Pelosi in the U.S. There is no way Xi Jinping is going to allow that to happen. And what happens next could change everything. It is being reported Chinese forces are gathering near the coast for a potential invasion. But I don't think China will launch a full-blown invasion of Taiwan quite yet. I agree. They're not going to do it yet but they are preparing. Instead, I think it's far more likely China could grab a couple of these small islands right off the Chinese coast that currently belong to Taiwan. If that happens, I believe the Biden administration would feel compelled to respond very forcefully. Of course, if both sides keep raising the stakes, it could escalate into a full-blown war in the Pacific very rapidly. And once a conflict begins, our trading relationship with China will halt. Are you prepared for that? So uh, people probably don't understand this, but let's talk about how that would affect us, how it would affect Americans because of how dependent our government has made us on other countries. Needless to say, it would hurt us badly in countless ways. For example, very little of our medicine is actually made here in the United States, and that is an enormous problem. According to a statement posted on the official website of U.S. Representative Mike Gallagher earlier this year, 80%, 80% of the drugs Americans use come from overseas, and China is the largest supplier. So. Yeah, the Chinese Communist Party has threatened to withhold life-saving drugs from the U.S. once, and we'd be crazy to think they won't attempt to do so again, said Representative Gallagher. Quote, Congress needs an aggressive plan to protect our critical pharmaceutical supply chains and end our reliance on China. This is a national security imperative, and to many Americans, a matter of life and death. Why was this allowed to happen in the first place, you might ask? Quote, the U.S. must end our reliance on China for life-saving drugs and critical medical equipment, Stefanik said. Quote, we become far too dependent on China's supply chain and their malign regime represents too great a threat to our national security for us to be at their mercy. 80% of the drugs Americans depend on come from overseas. China, whose pharmaceuticals have been subject to numerous recalls, is the largest manufacturer. As a result of this reliance, the U.S. has not produced basic medicines like in the case of penicillin since 2004. That is insane. Are the pills you take every day made in China? You might want to check. And once war with China starts, our supply of antibiotics will dry up very, very rapidly. Right now, the U.S. has virtually no capacity to manufacture antibiotics. That's because China currently controls roughly 90% of the global supply of inputs needed to make generic antibiotics that treat bronchitis, pneumonia, 
pediatric ear infections, and life-threatening conditions such as sepsis. At the peak of last year's COVID hospitalizations in the U.S., these generic antibiotics, including azithromycin, were urgently needed to treat secondary bacterial infections. However, the U.S. faced a potential shortage since the key materials of azithromycin and other drugs are supplied by China. We should never have allowed ourselves to become so dependent on one of our primary global rivals. Thank you, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger and Associates. Uh, it's Nobody says that. It needs to be said more. That's Henry Kissinger. This was his idea. He brought China into the World Trade Organization in December of 2001, right after 9-11. He knew exactly what he was doing. He's a communist thug. He's a scumbag. Not just Henry Kissinger, but Rothschild, Bank of London, all of the Wall Street. This was all them because they were profiting from this. All of the experts could see a scenario like this coming, but nothing was ever done. Two years ago, there was a major article about this in the New York Times. Quote, if China shut the door on exports of core components to make our medicines within months, our pharmacy shelves would become bare and our healthcare system would cease to function. Read that quote again. If this thing with Taiwan gets out of control and we go to war, our healthcare system, quote unquote, would cease to function for the duration of such a conflict. What will we do then? Does anyone have an answer for that? If people can't take their pills, how many of them would go insane? Never has there been a population more dependent on pharmaceuticals than Americans. Absolutely crazy. Almost 70% of Americans take at least one prescription medication and more than half take at least two, according to a new study by researchers at the Mayo Clinic. The most common prescriptions are for antibiotics, antidepressants, and opioid painkillers. One-fifth of Americans are taking five or more prescription drugs. Our healthcare system has been pushing that as the answer for everything. Uh, as I've been warning for years, a, for a full-blown war with China would be absolutely unthinkable, but our leaders are provoking one anyway. I wish that I had the words to express what I am feeling. Indeed, don't we all? Continuing, 75,000 people in the UK are refusing to pay energy bills, and the number is growing. Don't Pay UK campaign to boycott payment of energy bills gathers pace. Yeah, I mean, how long do you think that's going to be allowed to go on? High inflation in Eurozone countries is mostly driven by energy and food prices. Inflation in the U.S. and U.K. is more broad-based than in the Eurozone. Inflation in Japan remains much lower than in other advanced countries. So as you can see here, Japan is, has kind of the smallest, but look at the United States. It has the highest isn't that crazy? Argentine Minister of Economy almost lynched by an angry crowd in Buenos Aires. Inflation is over 60% and the Argentine people are hungry. amazing yep just amazing look at that so argentina argentinians are pissed um so here we have mark warner talking out his butt the ira will restore an irs budget that's been robbed by previous administrations the money will go towards enforcing taxes on ultra wealthy modernizing tech and expanding customer service 
No, 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 no. He is lying to you. Listen to this scumbag lie. I'd also say I think most of us, particularly over the last couple of years, if you've not been frustrated by the IRS in terms of getting a tax refund or getting somebody on the phone, then you've not, not had the kind of normal experience. I hear from Virginians every day who are frustrated that the IRS is just not being responsive at all. Uh, I live in Virginia, and my problem is I'm getting robbed blind by the federal government and the IRS, you scumbag. He he knows that, too. He is such a... Oh. Th these people are out of touch with the problems that regular Americans face. They don't face them because they're all making money. This is a multimillionaire, this man. He does not represent you or your interests. He doesn't care about working class people. Yeah. I think you do need to bring the IRS back into a modern agency that's actually consumer right. friendly, that has modern technology. Uh, we were on the path to actually having it totally dysfunctional and you know the worst of both worlds. You don't collect the taxes All that right. are owed and you've got an agency that doesn't well, do Well, just have well a flat tax, tax, get rid of- Wow. So Occupy the Fed movement says this is complete nonsense. As we said, 87,000 new IRS agents will not go after the ultra wealthy. The IRS never has and never will. They will, however, go after the rest of Americans, especially those who don't have the means or ability to resist. Exactly. From ProPublica. Secret IRS files trove of never-before-seen records reveal how the wealthiest avoid in t income tax. You think they're going to go after these people? Hell no. They're going to go after the people who are going to be already facing hardships and problems because of inflation, layoffs, etc. So that's the goal here. Chuck Schumer says the Inflation Reduction Act was written with the American people in mind. Families struggling to pay bills, kids who struggle with asthma and pollution, seniors who can't afford life-saving medicines. This bill is for them. The American people deserve nothing less. The Inflation Reduction Act is not going to reduce inflation. It wasn't designed for the American people. And what he's actually doing here, and I think this is disgusting, is he's laughing at you. He is laughing at you. He knows this isn't for people struggling to pay bills. He knows that it's going to make things harder for them. He knows that their taxes are going to be increased. He He's laughing at you. The American people deserve nothing less. You think he gives a damn about the American people? He doesn't. None of them do. Never in history have U.S. consumers gone so far into their savings just to stay afloat. The only reason it's even possible and we don't totally collapse is printed money, paused evictions, and frozen student loans. There is no strength here. And this is the personal, looking at personal savings. This is going back to 1990 all the way to 2022. And it is crazy. It's absolutely insane. No one earning under 400000 a year will pay a cent more in taxes. My word as a Biden. You still sticking with that, big guy? Tax hikes in the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. In 2023, 97.2% of those earning between $100,000 and $200,000 would see a tax increase. 91.3% of those earning between $75,000 and $100,000 would see a tax increase. 61.7% of those earning between $40,000 and $50,000 a year would see a tax increase. 24.6% of those earning between just ten dollars to $20,000 a year would see a tax increase tax increase so it's everybody everybody and it's that they're they're not going to go after the rich come on senator ted cruz says the democrats want to make the irs larger than the pentagon state department the fbi and border patrol combined we should abolish the irs exactly we taxation is theft Senator from texas mr cruz proposes an amendment numbered five two six three to amendment numbered five one nine four Madam President, there are, there are a lot of bad things in this bill, but few are worse than the proposal by Democrats in this bill to double the size of the IRS and create 87,000 new IRS agents. 
I guarantee you, citizens in every one of our states, if you ask them what do they want, they don't want 87,000 new IRS agents. And they're not being created to audit billionaires or giant corporations. Yep. They're being created to audit you. Uh, the, the House Ways and Means Committee, the minority, has put out an estimate that under this bill, there will be 1.2 million new audits per, per year, with over 700,000 of those new audits falling on taxpayers making $75,000 or less. I believe personally we should abolish the IRS, but at a minimum we shouldn't make the IRS larger than the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI, and the Border Patrol all combined. That's what the Democrats are proposing here. It is a terrible idea. If you don't want 87,000 new IRS agents, vote yes. Amazing. We will start being taxed on things that we sell secondhand. Amount of, of over $600 will be taxed, so of course they'll want more brown-shirted IRS people. Exactly. From Business Insider, just from August 5th, we've been living in a tent for five months because we couldn't afford our $1,200 rent. Now we're preparing for winter in Maine. Guys, this is, it's stunning. Lauren Barr and her husband have been living in a tent for the past five months. She said they're known as the working homeless because their low earnings won't cover rent. This is her story as told to Jane Ridley. I used to work at a hair salon in our small resort town in Maine. Wealthy clients would talk away about the second home they'd recently purchased nearby. They'd say they wanted a blowout before having dinner at some fancy restaurant. I'd think, I'm going home to a bowl of cereal. My husband Benji and I live in a tent. And as we head toward winter, we're increasingly worried about being homeless. I quit my receptionist job at the salon in May. I couldn't deal with the stress of having to look presentable all the time. The owner yelled at me once for wearing a pair of open-toed sandals with dirty feet. I had, cho I had to choose between not bathing or washing myself in a 40-degree river. I couldn't afford nail polish, let alone a pedicure. Benji and I are classed as the working poor. He is a barista at Starbucks, and I'm now employed by a cannabis dispensary. The hours we earn 17 and 15 an hour respectively vary and are not guaranteed. Our average combined salary is $2,400 a month. It's above the federal poverty line, but still not enough to make rent in the place we both grew up. We didn't want a formal eviction notice on our records from a court. We don't have a roof over our heads because we don't have enough money to rent an apartment. Rent in our area is upwards of $1,800 a month with utility bills on top of that. The cost has more than doubled in the past two years. Long-term leases are hard to find because landlords do short-term rentals on Airbnb. Houses sell at top dollar to city folk who want a second home in a beautiful place. Things started to go wrong after my mom, who owned the two-bedroom apartment where we lived with my daughter for four years, started formal proceedings to evict us. We hadn't been able to make rent for January or February. Mom and I always had a volatile relationship, but I never thought she'd kick us out. We lived paycheck to paycheck. Then I lost my job at a bagel store after getting sick for a month from COVID. I ended up with a nebulizer because it left me with asthma and pr potential damage to my lungs. My husband got it too. He missed two weeks of work. My mom said the next steps would be dealt with in court. We left the apartment in mid-March to avoid getting a formal eviction on our records, would make, which would make it impossible to find new housing. But we couldn't even begin to afford anything. One of the worst experiences of my life was driving my 13-year-old to Cape Cod, Massachusetts to live with her dad. My ex is a good guy, but I have no idea when I'd see my kid again. Gas was expensive, and our 18-year-old Subaru Forester needed a lot of repairs. You feel vulnerable when you have no place to retreat. We dropped my daughter off and spent the night at a rest stop on the Massachusetts-New Hampshire state line. Then we moved to a Walmart parking lot. We put down the seats of our car and used plywood as a base for a bed. We'd pile on blankets until it was sort of comfortable. Signs said you couldn't park overnight, but at least eight other vehicles would be parked nearby. We'd use the Walmart bathrooms, keeping a low profile to avoid suspicion. A friend loaned us a roof rack where we put our belongings, which we would cut down to the bare minimum. The biggest challenge was being perpetually damp. 
we stored our clothing in plastic bins to keep them as dry as possible. The weather started getting better toward the end of April. A nonprofit in New Hampshire called Waystation gave us a tent and other camping gear, such as sleeping bags and a tarp. We drove up to White Mountains National Forest and found a spot. It's first come, first served. There's well water, but no facilities like toilets or showers. The main rule is not to stay in one place for more than 14 nights. The rangers will move you if you don't comply. After that, you're not allowed to camp within 10 miles. Some of the other campers are nosy and ask why you're there all the time. The rangers have circled and we've moved at least seven times now. As for cooking, we've set up a little two-burner stove that runs on propane. We eat a lot of carb-heavy foods, including noodles you can get for a dollar, macaroni and cheese, pretty much any type of potato, anything that's not going to spoil. We've learned to get by, at least for now. There's a river nearby to get washed in. We wear our swimsuits to go in, but we'll go naked if it's hot and no one else is around. The heat is actually harder to handle than the cold. It's exhausting being outside when you don't have a place to cool down. At least you can bundle up in the winter. Looking back, the first few weeks of camping were the most difficult. It was a combination of being away from my daughter for such a long time and the fear of the unknown. There have been moments, mostly on the drive back from work, when I can't stop crying. I think I'm done for the day, but I don't have a home to go to. I just have a tent. My husband has been my rock and has kept me sane. Wow. We haven't really broadcast our situation. When someone finds out you're homeless, it gets uncomfortable. It's scary to them. Benji and I have gotten a lot of advice from the nonprofit that gave us the tent. They said the latest census showed more than 4,000 homeless people in Maine, but those are the only ones who report themselves as being homeless. We're on the wait list for Section 8 housing, but they told us it would take five to eight years. We applied to the General Assistance Fund, but were turned away because our income was considered too high. Right now, we're having a daily debate about what to do next. We're barely scraping by, and we don't know how we'd pay for even a cheap winter rental. At this point in our lives, I'm 36, my husband is 30, we might get an apartment only to lose it immediately. The stereotype of a homeless person as someone whose drug use resulted in them sleeping rough. But that's not our situation. It's getting harder than ever to be poor in this country. Yes, exactly. And it's... It, it is, I've been homeless and it is a terrifying thing, especially as a young woman and something I never want to face again, but I understand what that's like and it's not fun. Turkish banks are adopting Russian payment systems, Erdogan says. Five Turkish banks have adopted Russia's mere payment system. Turkey's president, Erdogan, said on his return from talks with Putin in the Black Sea resort of Sochi. There are serious developments regarding the work that Turkish banks are doing on Russia's mere card. Exactly. Payments in rubles will be a source of financial support for both Russia and Turkey, he said, adding the central bank governors of the two countries also met during the visit. Putin and Erdogan agreed to start moving to partial payments in rubles for deliveries of natural gas at talks in Sochi. So this is more about de-dollarizing. And, you know, we've talked about before Russia and China. We've talked about BRICS. We have talked about other nations sort of getting on board with de-dollarizing and moving into, as Putin said, he was building a new world order. And then finally, to close it out here, house pipe ban affecting millions in England begins as heat wave may return. Southern water limits uh, customers across Hampshire and Isle of Wight with fines. Um, so a housing pipe ban imposed on England for a decade is now in force. So these people are not able to get water. They're not able to water their garden because of this ban. This is called, um, oh, what's the word? Shoot, I forgot, but it, it is uh, austerity. This is austerity measures, right? When you are not allowed to do basic things like water a garden that you used to be able to do because they're putting uh, restrictions on things like water. Um, that kind of thing is going to continue. I mean, really, when we talk about things like the the Great Reset and um, like all of their sustainable, the UN Agenda 2030, sustainable development, stuff like that, 
carbon taxes. They want to have the ability to kind of restrict the amount of energy you're able to use. And that's why I think all of this is happening. It is to crash the system, the global system, and it is to kind of usher in a great reset and get people desperate enough where they will accept something like carbon taxes and the ability to shut, shut off your energy, shut down your electric vehicle. I mean, that's what they want to move into, this type of system. They want everybody in the UN smart cities. They want to be able to control everything and shut you down. If you say something they don't like, they're going to shut off your digital currency. They don't want you to be able to have cash. They don't want you to be able to barter. They want to control everything. This is a global takeover. It is a consolidation of wealth and power, and really it's global communism. They'll call it something like communitarianism or whatever, but that's what it is. And of course, it's only for poor people. The, it's not going to affect the uber wealthy because they're going to be the ones in control. They're going to be the ones running things. That, again, this is why you have to prepare now. You should have been preparing a long time ago, but if you haven't, start preparing because things are going to get much worse before they get better. And we are, this is a, a transitional phase between the old system and a new system that they're bringing in and they're changing jobs. Automation is putting people out of jobs. The, the landscape is different than when I was a young girl and I was homeless, right? When I was 17 and my mother threw me out of the house, I at least was able to work at a restaurant. I was able to kind of quickly transition into doing things like fine dining where I can make a couple hundred dollars a day if I worked a double, maybe. Maybe one day I'd make a hundred bucks, but another day I'd make $450. But we don't have those uh, options anymore. They're getting rid of wait staff. All of these things that were available in the past that you could do, it's just, it's not there anymore. Those kind of jobs no longer exist and they're not going to come back. So people need to prepare for that.